Good evening. I'm Ann McLean from the Library's Music Division. It's a great pleasure for me tonight to be talking with Le Consort, Augusta McKay Lodge, Sophie Bardonesh, Hannah Salzenstein, and Justin Taylor. These four really brilliant young players will be taking us on a whirlwind grand tour of Europe this evening. Music from England, Italy, Germany, and France. So welcome so much and thanks for being here. They are on a 20-city tour, right, for, for North America, which is pretty enviable for any ensemble, really, especially a young group. And a lot of really major venues are presenting them. Um, you just came from, what was it, Boston? Yeah, yeah we played in Boston two or three days ago. And, yeah, and of course, Boston, Washington, it's for us such an honor to play in these uh, very well-known halls and very, with very beautiful acoustics, so we are so happy to be here. I had the pleasure of working with Justin because he was one of the virtual artists we presented just during the pandemic. And we presented his recital at the beautiful, is it Chateau d'Assas? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, of course, I would have preferred to come and play for you. <laughs> but uh, when Anne McLean uh, told me I was supposed to record um, a recital, I went to a very nice uh, chateau in the south of France, near Montpellier. And it's a 18th century chateau with a historical harpsichord. So a harpsichord built in the 1730s. So it's always uh, quite incredible for us musicians to play on historical instruments. And so it was the perfect occasion to record it for you. And I think you can still see that on our website, actually. So check it out. Um, I really look forward to having you hear from them some of the projects they're doing because each one of these artists has major projects, all sorts of different things that they're working on, some with period instruments. Um, I know like Trio Dixer is one that you're involved with um, and so on. But, but for now, let's start with the program itself, which is such a fascinating and very rich program and relates to the exhibit that we have in the, in the uh, foyer, which we can talk about as well. But um, this program really spotlights great violinists, violinist composers, I should say, people who really created the repertoire, and Corelli in particular, and we have a case of Corelli out there. And you underline the stature of the trio sonata with the two violins with the Dandrieu program, a Dandrieu sonata as an important element. You've talked about this as one of your favorites and a kind of a watchword for the group. And I'm curious, not so many people know his music so well. What about this particular project, uh, program um, element has been your favorite? What about that piece? Actually, hey, good evening first. <laughs> um, this is the sonata by Don Rieu is the very first sonata we performed together when we decided to create an ensemble. Um, Justin knew this music before, and so we just read it, and we, it was love at first sight. <laughs> you know, really, because this music was never recorded before we decided to record and to play it in concert. And for us, it, it was such a pity, because it's really beautiful music, and uh, the, the influence, it's influenced by Italy, but also with a French touch. It's the unique music for us. And this composer, Jean-François Dandrieu, is not famous at all. Rameau, of course, is famous, but he didn't make, a, he didn't manage to to have success, but success, sorry, but also because maybe he was a monk, so he was playing the organ, he was not in the popular circle, <laughs> you know, and but his music is so beautiful, so we are really happy to present this music to to you tonight. <laughs> Sophie has written the notes in your program, so, so they're, and they're excellent. They, they tell me, told me a lot of things that I, I did not know about at all. This is, and you talked about the spirited pieces and um, characters, different characters for this particular piece. What, talk a little bit about that and the interplay between the two violins. Um, well, this sonata is in four movements, and the, so the very first is. Um, Actually, the Don Rieu is uh, playing with the, the, the duo in between the violin. I begin with the first part, and then it's uh, the same with the um, second violin. It's really pretty much influenced by Italian uh, rota, how to say rota? Suspension. Suspensions. So the first movement is, um, um, yes, um, 
melancholic one. And then the second one is an allegro uh, with a fugue and a contre sujet. <laughs> sorry for my vocabulary, it's not so good in English, but um, yes, and the third one is really influenced by the, the, co the composer you just said, Arcangelo Corelli. And uh, the, the fourth is a jig, which is particularly a dance like movement, very French one, um, very rhythmical. Um, and we love this music because it's really contra contrasting that, I mean, the, the very first movement is very slow and such as the third and the, the two and the, uh, the fourth are really a brilliant and virtuous movement and so we love to play this music because we can um, add a lot of our um, sentiments, like our... Yeah, feel our feelings in this music because it's sometimes depressing. Like the first movement, you can, I mean, not die for it, but it's really <laughs> something sad. <laughs> and just after, nothing comparable. I mean, it's uh, such a, a happy piece, such a dance, dancing, so, yes, very, very brilliant. So we love to play this sonata, and I think it's, it's a great sonata to hear because it's so contrasting. You never had the a time to to feel like to get bored. To, to get bored. <laughs> yeah, it's just enjoyment. So that is. And and the Corelli thinking going ahead with the the virtuoso violin theme. Um, of course, Corelli is a, a great master of the age and and of the trio sonata and so on. I was fascinated to watch your video where you talk about ornamentation for Corelli. And if you guys are interested, there's uh, you can look on YouTube, and it's called Voices of Music, I think. In fact, yes. tell us what wh is that a channel or is it a, a project? But anyway, she talks at length about exactly what, how you ornament, and when. <laughs> please, yeah. Well, uh, Voices of Music is a orchestra based on the West Coast, with whom I play, and um, they have a YouTube channel. And sometimes they have educational tutorial videos on that channel. And this one is about ornamentation in Corelli, which is the method of adding notes, of adding flourishes to a melody that's already written on the page. And in the Baroque era, in this Italian style, I mean, it was really important. Um, they just wouldn't play anything plainly without adding a bunch of extra notes. Um, yeah, so. There's a certain style that you can use in Italian music versus another style for French music. And so for Corelli, we have a, a Corellian style that we use. And, and it's nice with the two violin parts because in these trio sonatas, they're very much intertwined with each other. They're dancing around each other. They're playing in the same registers. It's very much two voices singing together rather than a melody line with a lower line. And so the ornaments can really um, flow in and out of each other in a very florid way, which is very Italianate and a lot of fun to listen to. <laughs> I hope, I think so. <laughs> um, and I was reading in, uh, somewhere that the ornaments that are in the Roger edition, no, uh, 1705, mm -hmm. may be the ones that he did himself. They may be, we don't know for sure, but it's, it's very likely. And so that's a great glimpse. We can see if it's true. We can see exactly what Corelli himself would have done, or if it wasn't him, at least one of his contemporaries, someone living at the time. Um, yeah, and then actually for the Corelli sonata, violin sonatas, we have examples of many other composers adding their own ornaments through the 18th century and, and, and uh, early 19th century, and you can see how the style develops and how the ornaments change. It's very interesting. So. <laughs> And, uh, in this edition that you can see in our glass case tonight, it says, one edition, the 1705 one, says it's correcting 600 errors from the past. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one, the 1715 edition, also on display, says it has been carefully edited, carefully corrected by ye best Italian masters. <laughs> So we, we tried, I was saying to them earlier, we tried to match what we have on display to what's being performed. And I, I got a kick out of, I can't resist saying this, got a kick out of this comment that I saw in the video that Augusta was in, say, from a listener or a viewer rather, saying, this channel is one of the few things that keeps me sane. <laughs> But um, so back back to the program for a moment. Maybe talk a little bit about the fact that you chose two La Folias, and the, the the one from Vivaldi and one from a rather unknown composer, Giovanni Reali, whom I didn't know. 
Yeah, my turn. <laughs> okay. So, yes, um, so there are two folias, and uh, one by a very, very famous composer, Antonio Vivaldi, and the other one is by Giovanni Battista Reali, which is another, um, like, uh, sort of composer we, uh, I mean, we found, uh, such as Dandrieu, and um, actually he was also living in Venice, and he was, uh, he published his um, Trio Sonata Opus, like, four years after Vivaldi's Trio Sonata Opus, so it's kind of obvious that he was, I mean, he, maybe they met, we don't know, but there is uh, a lot of uh, similarities, and the one, uh, the most, um, like, obvious similarity is that the 12th Sonata is also a folia, which means, uh, like, variations on a theme, very ancient theme, and, I mean, I really like the realist folia for something, but they already know, <laughs> just... <laughs> it's a very egocentric thing. It's because there is a cello concertante part. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, but it's just, it's kind of one of the differences between the two folias. Uh, and also the style is very different, and it's a, it's a really a real pleasure to play both of the folias, and because we take pleasure in playing. And there, there is no really, it's not really the same, and it shows us how like imaginative and creative uh, composers can be. And um, so it's kind of a mirror, and then you can tell us which one you preferred. <laughs> and I think you mentioned, or maybe your, the notes mentioned, that there's a, at the end it goes from du triple to duple meter, so it, it has an instant yeah. warp speed movement forward, and it's kind of fun. But I liked your line about how this was before accelerando was even invented as a term. <laughs> um, in terms of the uh, overall program, talk about how you decided to fit in the Purcell, and we have also a lot of Purcell on display as well. Why did you choose, yeah, how did How did you choose? Um, yeah, Purcell wrote, I think, 22 trio sonatas. And actually, the trio sonata uh, repertoire is huge. I mean, Bach, Vivaldi, all the French composers, Corelli, Purcell, Handel, ev ev everyone has written trio sonatas. So it's also why we present this like journey of all the European styles, because uh, we have the feeling as an ensemble that it's a repertoire sometimes a bit neglected, and we don't hear that often, trio sonatas. And, um, and so we, we wanted to play a bit of each style, and of course Purcell is one of the most uh, representative of uh, English style. And so actually we did with Purcell, as we did with all the composers we are playing, we run through all the sonatas, and then we pick the one we, we preferred. And uh, this one is very special and very different from all the others because it's based on a ground bass. So Anna and me will like repeat the same uh, eight notes all the eight or nine minutes it, the piece uh, lasts. And, but we make some variations on it, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so it's, it's, it's very special, this kind of uh, basses, because it brings a kind of a melancholy and um, uh, feeling of the time going on, passing, uh, getting older. I think it's a, s somehow a reflection on the, the um, a bit like still lives in painting. You know, it's like the time passes and death is approaching, and but hope is everywhere, so it's always very uh, complicated. And on this uh, bass, the two violins are incredibly imaginative, and so it's one of, I think, Purcell's ma masterpieces. Um, thinking about the projects that you guys are all doing um, together and, and uh, separately, you have so many very, you're a very curious group, you're a very adventurous group. You're doing so many things and would you mind saying a little bit about some of those projects? And Augusta, um, I know that you, uh, you're doing a lot with orchestras, including Les Arts Florissant and so forth, but you are, um, are traveling back and forth a, a lot, you and uh, Justin maybe particularly. Um, and so maybe go from here to here, <laughs> well, <laughs> what your current projects are. Illustrious CV. <laughs> um, yeah, well, first of all, I'm, I mean, I'm so honored to be here today because I'm actually subbing in with Le Consort. I've known them for maybe the past three or four years, but um, 
I have the pleasure to play with them here today because um, their violinist Teotim Langua du Swart can't be here today because he's on paternity leave. So I'm really um, uh, happy to take his place, I was going to say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, so we were thinking about Teotim. We wish he could be here. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to play with you guys. And yeah, otherwise, I, I, I moved to France about five years ago. I'm American, um, grew up in Oberlin, Ohio. And I'm sub semester for Les Arts Florissants, which is a Baroque orchestra in Paris. Um, I play with other groups there. I still do a lot uh, here in the States, um, a lot on the West Coast, some stuff in New York. I went to Juilliard in New York. So yeah, I kind of have my feet on both sides of the pond. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's about, <laughs> about it. Oh, and instruments. Maybe I'll save Justin for a last, I uh, have something to ask him about that, but instruments, Sophie, you have an instrument from the, is it Junior Jumpstart Foundation? But what instrument is it, and how does this influence your work? Um, um, so uh, I was very lucky to have on load a very beautiful violin from Amati, which was uh, one of the very first maker in Cremona. Or uh, it was not the father. There is the the one who created the violin. Basically, was Andrea Amati uh, around uh, 15, uh, 20, 15, yes, 1520 in Cremona, and uh, it was the first that created the violin as we know today with a uh, sound post, sound post. <laughs> just to be sure that I don't uh, use a good term. Yeah, so he created a sound post between the, um, the two parts of the violin. And so that, 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 that the sound, when you put the, this little piece, just changed a lot if you um, don't have this, the, the sound is really different. And then you can still hear the, the sound in medieval music, but yes, this, so this uh, maker make, made a big change in the Lutri world. And I had the chance to play on the violin by his son, and which was uh, the father of the one who teach Stradivarius, because at this time in Cremona, it was really the the main, I mean, I mean the capital of uh, Lutri, the best violin of the world comes from this uh, this city. But actually, no, I have, uh, there. the loan is finished, but I still have a very beautiful violin from this city, which was uh, Guarneri. So I'm lucky too. But you won't see an Amati, but a Guarneri, but not a Del Gesù. The Guarneri is a big family. And my violin is from the grandfather of the Del Gesù Guarneri. So and if you want to take a look after, you can. Like, And uh, if I have to say some uh, word about me, and after maybe we'll go back to Justin and Hannah, I'm also playing with Les Arts Florissants in Paris. And uh, so we created Le Concert, and I just finished recording my first solo album, which will be dedicated to women baroque composer of a French power composer, and um, I was doing research on this subject since um, more than three, four years to find like, and I really, I'm really happy because I found some scores never recorded, and in fact there were a lot of women uh, uh, playing music and writing music in the 18th century, and no, nobody heard about them because it's still manuscript. So I'm really happy to to play this music and to and to, so people can dig, discover the music for the first time and listen to it. So that the recording will be out uh, in next fall, and that's my last project. Uh, so, um, yes. And, but they have a lot and, of <laughs> and these are all, like I say, there are just so much that is rich that they're doing. It's, it's, it's a great variety. And I'm interested, can you tell them about your invitation uh, to the Schumanns, among <laughs> other things? Uh, yes, so that was um, so it's, uh, a recording that was out in last September that we recorded uh, at the Museum of the Cité de la Musique in Paris. Uh, it's, um, we recorded on um, instruments from the museum, so a very uh, old piano um, that, um, from the end of uh, 18th century, uh, 19th century, sorry, like uh, 1870, I think, a bit late, a bit um, after Schumann's di died, but still, uh, Bösendorfer, and uh, I played on the Guarneri uh, de Venise uh, 
very, very beautiful instrument. And it was, uh, so we recorded with the Theo team, uh, Longle de Swart and uh, Fiona Matou. It was uh, like a whole project around Schumann uh, and Clara Schumann, like um, a sort of, um, a way to recreate uh, a salon, uh, a musical uh, salon uh, that they could have uh, lived uh, before uh, Schumann uh, became to lose his mind, began to lose his mind a bit. <laughs> so it was like the happy and uh, love uh, years. Uh, and so they, they uh, met a lot of composers such as Mendelssohn and Brahms, but also like Niels Gad, which is a very unknown composer now, but and also Theodor Kirchner. So it was a way to invite uh, the audience to hear the the sound of the old piano, because it was built uh, around the sound of this old piano and also old instruments with the good strings, and also to discover some new uh, um, repertoire and, uh, and uh, new uh, composers. It was very, very special and uh, project very, um, very personal, and uh, we had the chance to, to play on these these instruments that are in the museum. I mean, we had to go there. It was really like a immersive project and very interesting for us and for me to discover this, to have the chance to play these instruments, probably uh, because I, I mean, it's a one of a life, uh, one, um, one experience in a life. So uh, it was uh, really special and. Uh, I like my cello too, but <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yes. So yeah. it's so wonderful to, to to know that you have all experimented so much with different instruments, yeah. and how this changes your life. And I remember you said this, Justin, when we were talking that you were interested in playing on pianos, not just harpsichords. And I, I was remembering that. And in your new album, you have, uh, I, if you can, talk a little bit about the Bach piece that you're going to be doing the the one that was transcribed especially by Bach is so beautiful and so well known as an oboe piece. But also about your album, he has a very rather recent one, Bach et l'Italie, and um, this reminded me of your comment about the piano because I think you're playing an Erard piano on this recording at some point, but I, don't rem I haven't heard the recording yet. Talk about all of that. Uh, I, th I think like the, what we all share uh, here as musicians is trying to um, match together our repertoire and the cor correct instruments uh, the, each repertoire uh, is meant to so, so yeah e it's a, each of our projects is, it's all about this actually and so uh, yeah I played uh, on a Erard piano also from the Cité de la Musique in, in Paris uh, I played a piece of uh, Debussy which is homage à Rameau so tribute to Rameau and the piece was composed just the, the years c close to the piano was built, so probably Debussy could have played on this piano, so it's always very interesting as musicians to be inspired by this uh, sound of the instrument, and somehow it gui guides us to play, I think, better this music. And uh, yeah, my actually my, my just um, r most recent album was uh, nominated this evening in a quite famous TV show for classical music, but I, I lost. I, I didn't <laughs> have the... <laughs> but I, I'm happy to, to be here, so no, no problem at all. <laughs> and uh, yeah, maybe my, my uh, next uh, big, or I mean, um, project I'm very looking forward to, to record is um, I will try to record the Chopin uh, Ch Chopin? How do you say? Frédéric Chopin? Chopin, yeah, he, he's mostly French, so we can say... Ch Ch <laughs> Chopin, Chopin. <laughs> uh, Chopin. Chopin preludes on a pianino, which is a very uh, uh, different, more or less, uh, kind of uh, playel pianos, and we know that Chopin ended composing his preludes in uh, Mallorca, the uh, Spanish island. He was sick, he was with uh, Georges Sand, this uh, famous French writer. And uh, we have a lot of letters of Chopin dying for receiving this very special pianino to compose the preludes. And so it's basically never have, have been done to play the preludes on pianino, so it's my next big uh, challenge, I would say. <laughs> and um, the Bach piece that 
the oh, yeah. open, uh, BWV 974, it's uh, when you play it, I listened to the clip of you playing it, yeah. it's very legato and you hear yeah. the orchestra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I yeah, not at all answered your first question. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, the legato at the harpsichord is one of my big uh, fights uh, in, uh, in the musical scene. Uh, you know, often harpsichord is uh, heard as like this clinky instrument and with a very weak sound, metallic, aggressive, acidic, I don't know what ever sound. And, but of course, I think it's much more than this and it's also a very sensitive and sensual instrument. And so la, la, the piece I will play at the very end of the concert is like a, a, a motto of this, uh, of this uh, aesthetic, and uh, it's imitating the oboe. Uh, the original piece is for oboe and string orchestra. So my left hand will repeat chords, but I try to arpeggiate them a lot, not to have uh, too much ver vertical uh, uh, musical feeling. And the right hand is uh, yeah, very melodic, and uh, Johann Sebastian Bach is helping a lot because he added ornaments, as Augusta said, like, basically filling up the disjunct uh, line and uh, and I think the legato is very important at the harpsichord. At one point, I think in the 50s, 60s of this uh, century when people were uh, like, uh, I don't know, Gustave Leonard, uh, Bill Christie and uh, Jordi Saval and all this uh, Arnoncourt, this very famous name and um, we are very lucky they were there because they did an amazing job but I think somehow they focused also on like the differences of Baroque music and the post-romantic. But I think there is maybe not that much difference. And for my, my instrument, uh, I don't think you just have to throw away all the advantages of the romantic playing and uh, rubato and legato. I think it's all uh, something very important to keep also in with a lot of, of course, Baroque uh, treatises and um, knowledge. but. Uh, I'm speaking way too long, sorry. <laughs> but but it's funny because I, I, as a student, like all my teachers were a lot telling me you should articulate, play shorter, play more rhythmical, and so on and so on. But when you read like Couperin, he says the harpsichord must sing. When you read like Bach, beginning of uh, um, uh, Wilhelm Friedman uh, clavier, he says you should play cantabile. So somehow I think it's not like a harpsichord shouldn't um, be um, as a like fight against piano. It's just an instrument you have to make sing because of course the instrument is not that singing by itself. Yeah. But I think the musician has to uh, put in some um, uh, yeah legato sensuality and um, uh, yeah. Uh, well. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's very interesting, also generational, you know, different perceptions, and as you say, these were masters of another time, and now you're... But, but I, I mean, I don't want to mi misinterpret oh, my, my uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, very, uh, I, I know they were amazing uh, uh, musicians, and uh, also Vanda Landowska, her harpsichord is just in the next, next, next door building, in Madison building, and uh, I think she brought also a lot of of, to this repertoire, but yeah, just, just uh, another generation. You know, th uh, the other question I was going to ask you about was the, the piece on your program, the Les Sauvages. Um, that's, I think you and I touched on that in, when we talked before, but I didn't know that this piece was, the sound picture of the piece came from an actual presentation that Rameau saw yeah. in France. If you can tell that story. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, very funny because it's a very famous tune. I, I think probably you will recognize it. And um, yeah, Rameau was this very um, inventive composer and an anecdote tells he, they were like a foire. How do you say foire? Like a foire? Do you know foire? <laughs> <laughs> foire in French? <laughs> <laughs> It's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's like an outdoor uh, event with uh, some theater, some uh, uh, animals, some... Uh, fair. Fair, yeah, fair. And so Rameau was at a fair in, in Paris, very beginning of the 18th century, and there were also a troupe of um, oriental music, and I'm uh, very, very exotic. And uh, he says he heard this tune over there, and then he decided to put it in a Baroque way. So now we hear it as a Baroque, but it has this very original uh, spirit. Drums. Yeah. He heard it with drums? Yeah, yeah, yeah. From, 
Les Indes Galantes, is that from, it's from it, there? It's uh, except from the Les Indes Galantes, yeah, which all the opera is quite uh, ex exotic. I mean, yeah. You know, I, I wanted to ask you about some new repertoire that you're working on that for me is personally is very interesting. And um, we, I know we have to keep an eye on the time because we have to get all the folks in who are waiting in line. But please tell the audience about Mrs. Philharmonica. This is fascinating to me. Yeah, actually, um, Mrs. Philharmonica is our latest disc, um, yeah, discovered, disco, discover with the Le Consort, because as we we talk about Purcell, and we we are playing, we were play, we played this Purcell sonata since we created the ensemble. So basically, since seven years, and we said like one day we should record this piece because we love it really. <laughs> And, but we wanted to add, because Purcell is, of course, very famous, so we wanted to add a less known composer, because we love to mix in our, our recordings, famous composer with less known composer that so the public can hear the famous pieces, but also new discoveries. And so um, uh, I was looking for a woman composer. Actually, I was looking for a French one, but I saw this Mrs. Philharmonica. Uh, and uh, there, there were two manuscripts, one in the British Li Library of London and one in Brussels. And it's probably a pseudonym, um, but actually, I, I, for the moment, we, we don't know who was her. We, uh, we tried to ask some musicologists, but they don't know for the moment. Um, uh, it's, uh, prob it's of course a woman because there were no advantage to publish with a female name. It will sell less <laughs> scores. So there, it was a, a woman, and the publisher was a little editor. It, uh, name was Richard Mears. R Richard Mears. He was playing the bass um, viol de gamba. The, the gamba. He was uh, also building instruments. <laughs> editing music, doing a lot of little things, but it was not a good, uh, a big uh, editor. Um, and so for the moment, we don't know nothing about her, but her music that we, we, are, we just record and that we are playing in concert. It's uh, two books of six, six sonatas, so 12 sonatas in total, and it's very much influenced by Italy. So the pseudonym is Philharmonica, so um, she, she probably loves Italian music, and she probably knew the famous Corelli. <laughs> always, Corelli is always some, somewhere with the trio sonata because he, wore the, he created the genre. He was really the master. So, yes, uh, uh, miss, this Mrs. Philharmonica was influenced by the, um, this music. But yeah, I can say nothing more for the moment. We're all doing research to find out who is she. But for uh, um, we can play the music, waiting what who she where she where <laughs> she was. It's still. A, is it a recording yet? Yes, it is just out since two Bravo. months. Bravo! Yeah, yes, that's great. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, well, I think we have time for just maybe one or two quick questions, and then I'll get a high sign from my colleagues that they need to let people in. Does any? Yeah, do you have a question? Yeah. When, you, when you're playing on uh, old instruments, as you've mentioned, how are these instruments tuned before you play them? It, it really depends on the, if, if it's strings or harpsichord. For harpsichords, often the pitch is a bit low because the, the highest it is the most um, tension the harpsichord has. So on old uh, harpsichords, they often tune it like half a tone underneath, uh, under the usual pitch. So my like my two last recordings are in 392 and not in 415 because I recorded on an original um, instrument. But actually, they tune as uh, modern instruments. Uh, I mean, you know, like we are playing on all violin and cellos, and but the strings are not old mm. and they are new <laughs> because the string break and so we have to change and so it's new string and also new pegs. I, I mean, you have to, to care about the, the, the instrument and so these parts we, we, we use for tuning, they are mostly new or it's, it's easy to, yes, to <laughs> because we, are, we have to play music on it. So mm. yes, it's not a big deal to tune the old. But it's it's one of the uh, incredible things about instruments. They don't really damage with time, and it's even the contrary. Like the, uh, especially for strings instruments, the older they are, the 
um, smoother, richer the sound is. So I think the more you play them, the more they are happy. So it's our f philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, actually, actually, we uh, we met uh, seven years ago in the Conservatoire de Paris. Justin knew each of of us, but it actually, it's particular because we have Augusta yeah. stepping in, which uh, and but uh, we know we know Augusta since uh, well, four or five years. But it it was at the beginning just love for baroque music, and we we just tried to to play music, and we said like ah, that that sounds good, and this music was never recorded. L let's play it in concert, and, and that's how it be it begins. And now we are here to yeah. play it, so it's we are very happy indeed. <laughs> yeah, it it began qu quite small, just rehearsing and as students, and and then we did our first concert and. Uh, first recording and uh, we made also some uh, we are uh, very often four musicians but sometimes we are uh, a bit uh, larger ensemble and in these cases Augusta is often uh, joining too uh, even with our uh, first uh, violinist uh, team so that's how also we we met uh, Augusta and uh, yeah things I mean yeah as Sophie said it's we never had thought we would be at the Library of Congress seven years ago so it's yeah. nice <laughs> Looking forward to play for you tonight. <laughs> Playing Dandrieu in Washington. Dandrieu in Washington. Like, yeah. wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>